screen. Hey, um, so I'm Michael Ade. Um, I'm the least important person in the room uh, because we have a fantastic panel of people. Uh, we've got Nigel Cook. Uh, Nigel's an Intel fellow. He works in their uh, software-defined infrastructure group. Correct. And uh, generally a wicked intelligent guy. So, and kind of fun to party with too. Um, we've got Martin Kiss. Martin is a Helium MVP and is uh, an OpenStack ambassador and founder of Hungarian OpenStack user group. So Martin, I've not partied yet with Martin, but I look forward to the opportunity. Uh, we've got <coughs> Sriram. Sriram doesn't really need an introduction, so I'm not even gonna introduce him. <laughs> you, you all know Cloud Don? If you don't know Cloud Don, then you need to know Cloud Don because Sri Ram's cool. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Hello. And he's easily embarrassed. So should I continue? Because it's <laughs> kind of fun watching. No, I, I guess like we have the entire session, so that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we're here to talk about a number of things, uh, but uh, mainly around uh, cloud and the enterprise and understanding what kind of uh, obstacles exist in getting cloud into the enterprise, what kind of barriers to adoption exist. Um, I, you know, they asked me to kind of moderate the panel. I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions, but these guys are super intelligent, and the majority of the time should be them talking. So with that, I'll shut the hell up and let things proceed. So I, I'll throw I'll drop my mic and then let things proceed. I'll throw out one question just to get everything started. Um, so OpenStack in the enterprise, is this, is this real? Is this something that we should be thinking about? What are the barriers to adoption for OpenStack in the enterprise? Uh, can I get you to start? Yeah. You could. So uh, it is interesting. Uh, it is definitely real. There are challenges, obviously. We just had a talk about up workloads the applications running on OpenStack, and uh, we had a great panel yesterday, right? So what are the barriers? Traditional enterprise applications are not cloud-aware applications. What I mean by that is they, are, they need to be highly ARM. They are mostly consistent. They are not like scaling up, scaling down kind of applications, and uh, they have high SLAs. If you look at OpenStack infrastructure, it doesn't support high HLA, uh, uh, highly highly availability always, right? The VMs don't wake up. If you lose a VM, it doesn't wake up again by, by itself. So those are the barriers that enterprises have in their mind. The other thing that's also happening is that, that they don't want to miss the train of OpenStack. They want to have OpenStack, but the problem that they have is, okay, I need to have OpenStack, but I have this old legacy application that I want to, that can I put it on OpenStack? Can I run my SAP workload on OpenStack? Or can I run the CRM application on OpenStack? I see that that's not the right way of approaching it. There are two things, right? Enterprises are not going to remain stagnant. They need to look forward, which means that you need to have new kind of applications, right? The whatever you are, you are running, yes, you need to continue the investment there. You don't want to kill them, but it is not the only type they're going to ever have, have later. So plan for those applications, right? And those applications will not be those static applications. Any application that gets written now or will get written in the, in the near future is going to be cloud aware. But that's going to be, you need to have m mobility, for instance. No enterprise can survive without having a su supporting mobile application. They need to be social. You cannot have employees to run on all desktops anymore, right? So all these are your requirements. So think in those terms and plan for those things. And infra OpenStack will support those applications. So that's kind of a starting point. OK, in some way, I can agree with Don. So basically, the huge change here that legacy applications simply won't fit into this cloud model. And I guess this adaptation will take some time because uh, deploying just a simple cloud won't solve all of our, our problems. And uh, we need to change at the organizational level. We need to change the development culture we are using. And especially, we can learn a lot from the startup companies. They are using this typical DevOps culture when, when uh, sysadmins have some developer knowledge and uh, they can work together. And uh, basically, a lot of things is different in cloud. Correct. If you want to see a well-performing application, 
we need to we need to build a clustered solution and uh, and stateless applications and of course um, um, we we need to do a very very different development model and we can learn about this typical continuous integration story how we are developing software it it, it is changing because uh, we think uh, uh, cloud software differently. Um, maybe the release dates uh, will be different. Uh, let's see the OpenStack uh, continuous integration system as an example. We are using OpenStack to develop OpenStack. And if we want, we can do a release every day, basically, using those new, new tool sets. So, so I think uh, it is a very early stage of a huge revolution and change set of the anti-IT industry. Yeah, hmm. So I, I guess I'm the contrary point of view here, uh, <laughs> uh, which is probably why I'm on the panel, I guess. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I sort of have to take odds with, with some of these statements here. And I think, you know, OpenStack is um, uh, getting towards uh, the enterprise uh, private cloud. In fact, there are um, some distributions which are great for that. And that's been because of, of um, uh, additions people have made into that cloud distribution which they're now upstreaming so that it will be available to everybody but you know I, I don't buy into hey cloud it's got to be stateless it's the only thing that works cloud infrastructure is by nature um, unreliable uh, I don't think that's how the public cloud providers build and run their infrastructure and I don't think that's how um, the enterprise private cloud should think about or run that infrastructure either. So to, to, to me, it's a matter of a cloud infrastructure delivers a certain SLA, and um, if you you can <laughs> once you can deliver to a, a particular SLA, it's a little bit like driving down the highway. You can drive at 20 miles an hour, you can drive at 40 miles an hour, you can drive at 60 miles an hour. And as long as you can set the speed that you want to run at, you can go different speeds, different distances, What's bad is if your car is going 20 miles an hour and then 60 and then back to 15 and then to 30. That, that's unreliable. And I think what we've got to get to is a reliable cloud infrastructure. And then all kinds of applications can run from stateful to stateless. Um, <laughs> so, so I was just going to say that's an interesting point. I think that um, as we uh, look at enterprise cloud, right, and, and, and if I may just summarize, that uh, there's this assumption that infrastructure that is cloud enabling is inherently unreliable mm -hmm. in all cases. And anything that's taken to uh, the extent, right, that, that it's being taken in the current model, right, is, uh, is wrong, right? Public cloud providers, many public cloud providers run a tight ship. They have a great management but, but infrastructure, they deploy good hardware. Private cloud infrastructures should should learn from what they've been practicing for the last 20 years, right? Which is deploy good hardware, deploy good infrastructure, deploy good management, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and that resolves weakness in yeah. the cloud. I have a point to Nigel's, right? So you're talking about cars. The only problem that enterprises uh, seem to have is car is not the only vehicle. You have multiple modes of transportation, mopeds, bikes, bicycles, anything, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you have a car and you think about a car, you only you are only thinking about having a fancy car or a reliable car. You are only thinking in that paradigm, right? Cloud is not like that. It's going to cater to multiple ways, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a different approach here. And uh, so, 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 so it's, the, it's, the, it's the error of arguing by analogy because you can always uh, extend it. But, but, but I think, that, you know, the, the, the great thing about um, OpenStack, and in fact this was highlighted in one of the keynotes um, this week, is that people are going to it because they want to build a tool chain on top of an open set of APIs, and then under that open set of APIs, they can have bare metal with Ironic, they can have a KVM hypervisor, they can have a, a, a Docker container, they can have um, Hyper-V, they can have VMware, they have all that sort of choice in what they deploy on underneath you know, a consistent and, uh, and open API set. Right. And I think that's how we need to look at, at OpenStack is enabling choice, um, both in the size of compute, but also then in the quality of service from storage and the quality of service from networking. 
I totally agree with you on that point. Yeah, yeah I agree on that. So we are not saying we that you cannot move your existing application stack into open stack. You can definitely. Mm -hmm. But uh, referring back to some real life examples, we were using OpenStack Cloud and there was some transition periods. And for example, if ha we have the proper uh, uh, tool set to automatically launch our application stack inside the cloud using the OpenStack API. For example, one time one of the or each public cloud instance simply died and it was much easier and faster to launch a new one Mm. Instead of calling the support and waiting for the resolution to bring back this instance to life. Yeah, so yeah. I think this is the big deal in, in cloud. Oh, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you think of the, 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 the legacy application running on two bare metal servers. That first bare metal server, don't you? Have I got a four hour, um, you know, uh, five day a week support policy or is it eight hour, or is it 24 hour? Um, with cloud, it's um, 30 seconds, I'm gonna go back to my console and, and reprovision it. That is the benefit of cloud. So th that's the benefit. Actually, that's the point that I think uh, you were talking the other side of that one. Public, the cloud is not necessarily inefficient or it's not necessarily failure prone. But what we are saying is that, that assume failure and develop for that. So that's a better, but that's a better approach. The legacy applications are the developers, they're like pampered with highly available infrastructure, mm -hmm. always on infrastructure. But what is reality is that it's no longer the case. I think the paradigm has changed and developed towards that. That's yeah. what is changing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And one, one more comment. I, I don't agree that public cloud is much more stable than private cloud. So Amazon, for instance, or Azure, for instance, they have their downtimes, they have their outages, right? So but, oh, they absolutely yeah. do. Yeah. But, but you know, but I, I was listening to Tim Bell talking about um, the joy of upgrading um, his <laughs> OpenStack cloud from you know Havana on. And what I'm saying is, you know, I, I think we've got a few steps to climb here, oh, and, and and it's definitely doable. But uh, so to that point, um, if I were to ask each one of you to give me three obstacles in priority order <laughs> that you see around enterprise cloud adoption of OpenStack, what would you, what would you say those are? Well, you go first and oh, you, oh, oh okay. now oh, he gets to <laughs> go first. <laughs> oh, it must be because it's a hard No, I can go first, that's oh, fine. Oh. I, I didn't want to in, hog Now remember, so. in priority order. Right? <laughs> yeah, it gives me time to think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine is like uh, incorrect expectations. Second is uh, the processes, the internal processes. Third, I would say, uh, it kind of goes with the, high, uh, the, the, ex uh, the expectations, right? the kind of work, the approach that you're taking. So by in expectation, what I mean is that you've had something going, it's been working for a decade, at least a decade, right? And you have the same expectations that this new shiny object will give you, you need to fix that one. Whether it's correct or not, I'm not here to argue whether it's correct or not. I'm just saying that it's a different set of expectation you need to have and think in those terms. And second thing is like enterprise IT, the way it operates. So um, anything that you want to have, you're creating an SLA, the IT will, you need a server now, it's going to go through an entire set of acquisition process, you create a ticket, it might take its own sweet time, a week, a month, depends on how, how fast your organization is, right? That's going to change. People are, the developers expect to have a self-service, they're going, to, they're going to expect that one, and they're going to operate on that one. What implies is that you have more agility, that's great, but it also creates a lot of friction. It might seem to be a threat for your system admin or IT department, right? They, they're going to resist you naturally. And your entire way of operation, your billing, and any, any, any moving piece that have, that have been operating with that expectation, they have to change. So that's a new process, right? You need to educate that. It's not that just you, you're going to swipe a credit card and get your system and you're done. It's not hap just, it doesn't happen in enterprises. You need to change that one. Third thing is, again, like it goes with the expectations there. You had set of setting applications, you need to think forward, right? You, you, are not, you, are not, you don't want to spend your cycle just for thinking about porting or rewriting. Just let them go or let them run. It's okay. It's okay to have two set or three set of infrastructure. But anything, like Nike is a great example. So um, they were mov moving their applications. They might have had their old applications, right? But anything moving forward, they were thinking mobile first, right? And they were thinking social first. So they were thinking in those terms and releasing their applications. Those, 
you you can argue whether it's going to be enterprise or not. I mean, if it's being adopted by a big company, a Fortune 500 company, it might have a different different usage characteristics. But like depending on the adoption or, or the or the revenue involved, like these are new set of applications. You should think in those terms. Those three are my top three. Um, yeah. Barriers. I think that cloud adoption into the enterprise mustn't be started by moving the business core applications into the cloud. Let let uh, give some time for the team to to build up a pilot cloud solution and learn the new model there. And I was at the Linux con conference in Düsseldorf and at the OpenStack booth, and I met with real customers. And the most of the questions came from that they had problems. First of all, uh, most of the customers don't want to start uh, a brand new IT infrastructure from scratch. They have existing network. And OpenStack need to fit into that, this existing network. Nobody wants to buy new devices just for OpenStack. This is one point. The other thing uh, that is very serious, that they want to upgrade their OpenStack cloud systems. And I think um, it requires a very special way of funding so of OpenStack. They but they're upgrading with you, they're very hand-ish, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I see th these uh, problems currently, that, that uh, we, need to, we need to run to uh, uh, start the cloud adoption in, uh, into enterprise. So this is the first uh, steps we need to finish first. Awesome. Nigel, have you had enough time to think? Well, you know, the, the, the hard thing in coming last is, you know, all the good ones are taken. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know... It's also good. You might have missed something. <laughs> no, no, no. So, so you know, you, I, I, I mean, I do, I do like what you said about, um, you know, it's, it's about processes and people as well as technology. That was, that was really good. And, and the, the, the legacy system piece is, is high on my list as well. So I'm going to leave those um, and I'm going to give three more. Um, but... but just assuming these other ones are already covered by the other speakers, right? Um, so, um, so you're, so you're. Let me get this straight. You're piggybacking on their highly prioritized items, yes, and giving us the rest of the list. I guess I am. Okay, all right. Just I check. Mean, you can juggle them each other way you like here, <laughs> but those are all those are all very valid uh, points there. But I think you know specifically if we talk about OpenStack. So, so assuming that you've already made the, the mental model that, hey, we're going to do cloud and, and, you know, now OpenStack specifically, if I narrow my view to that, right, I think that um, uh, deployment and upgrade would have to be like the number one thing that, that needs to be addressed in OpenStack to get real mass adoption. Um, I would say um, the maintenance functions in, in OpenStack, the operational aspects of it, um, uh, are another piece that need hardening. So, um, so particularly here, uh, uh, you know, I have to do some firmware maintenance on this row in my data center. How do I do that without complete chaos in my OpenStack cloud? That, that's a great use case that needs to be, you know, uh, addressed. You are an upgrade, you are pretty much. So, so, and then the third one then, if I've got one left, um, I'm, I'm going to have to re, I'm going to have to reuse one here. Um, definitely the, the uptake of a legacy environment. So if I've already got a data center full of my favorite hypervisor, you know, maybe it's a, uh, VMware environment, maybe it's a Microsoft environment. What I need to be able to do is move that into the cloud versus build something separate and have to sort of migrate it in. And so I think that would be, if we had all those three, I think there would be runaway sort of uptake of, of um, OpenStack anyway. So um, I'll, ask, I'll ask kind of a fluffy question, a little bit of a fluffy one. Because we've had a couple of really hard questions, right? <laughs> What's your favorite project in OpenStack? Swift. Swift. Why? That's a good question. So, um, well, it's <laughs> sorry. Um, so I like generally like I don't like um, the need for com uh, specialized hardware. So Swift is a great example of how you turn commodity hardware 
into a, a very simple set of hardware into high reliable, highly redundant, and distributed storage. So that's why it's personal. Uh, if you're asking me w in a different way, I would say <laughs> Neutron because of its problems, or at least how we sail through those problems. Interesting. Yeah, my favorite project is not an open stack one. It's, it is Ceph that, Ceph that solves this commodity storage problem. <laughs> so you're so you're supersetting. Yeah, but, super but anyway, <laughs> anyway, I love I love all of the OpenStack projects from Trove to Nova. And yeah. Mm. Uh, m my favorite project or, or my favorite latest feature in OpenStack, let's say, would have to be um, in Horizon. There was a uh, a metadata repository that was called added into Horizon that was called um, Graffiti. And the idea of that project is to, um, to provide annotation of um, particular um, uh, you know, images and requests so that as a user requested um, an instance, it could be best matched to the right space in the underlying infrastructure. And, and that, gives, that gives choice, it gives the ability to have a sort of a differentiated uh, cloud environment. So that one wins my... Um, at least my vote for now. Ideally, making the scheduler, giving the scheduler the ability to make informed decisions. Informed decisions, correct. Informed decisions, yeah. Can, can I ask you guys back, what do you think of triple O? Wow. Wow. Well, <laughs> you've got to answer that one. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, gonna, you can I'm not going any, anywhere any, near that. The audience can answer that. <laughs> what do you think of triple O? What do you guys think of triple O? Question for the audience. Oh, well, do you guys know about triple O? It's... So Triple-O's triple a project called OpenStack on OpenStack, and uh, hence Triple-O, right? And it's a deployment capability, so it allows you to install OpenStack using OpenStack. It's kind of Inception. Yeah, and anyway, like we Inception. are using OpenStack into a lot of different things because we are using OpenStack to develop OpenStack and run the test. Mm. So, you're not getting an answer from no. the audience, no. I guess. <laughs> Does anybody in the audience have any questions? I'm a little surprised on your kind of list. Because, uh, <laughs> when it comes down to enterprise, mm. the bugbear of most things is you can spin up a machine in seconds nowadays. And we all hear about your favorite projects. But the one thing that enterprise hates is the network. I'm surprised that you don't include any kind of integration and neutron and all that sort of stuff into legacy protocol networking. Because I can tell you that's where most enterprise network it, networks lose. Or let's say OpenStack loses its agility. Yeah. So you've only got two legs on this chair. And I know there's a lot of work going on with Neutron. Mm. But OBS is kind of a disaster uh, <laughs> as regards enterprise networking. Mm. And uh, there's lots of things like that. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised that that wasn't high on your list because everybody goes for the compute and the storage. So why wasn't that high on your list? Because I'll tell you, that's the most unagile un part of OpenStack. Well, yeah, I mean, Neutron is an interesting, the networking is an interesting space. And, and I think that, um, so when I included sort of set up and deployment, I was actually including that. And when I was calling legacy um, ingest, I was also including um, that networking component, but but you're right. Networking is um, you know is a very uh, interesting and in inverted commas space um, in cloud. But I, I do think though um, you know despite some of the um, uh, maturing issues around the, the V switch, that the notion of um, using an overlay network to, to build your um, you know your interconnectivity in cloud. Is, is, a, is a great direction um, and is one that lets you um, basically overlay on top of an existing infrastructure versus you know having some some deep point integration into the into that existing infrastructure so I, th I think it's I think it's on the right approach there are actually um, I, I must say um, uh, technologies from Intel which are being upstreamed which dramatically improve the performance of the V switch um, we integrate it with DVDK, which will give you higher performance and lower um, CPU utilization, for example. Um, so I, I, I love the direction of, of the vSwitch, but clearly it's, it is a, a work in progress 
but great progress has been made. I, I want to add to that one. Uh, as a community, yes, we understand that Neutron is a mess, but we have, the community has taken good action so far and trying to get it to a good stable state. But I wouldn't call that as a, a, a barrier for adoption, right? You still had, until last release, right, you still have NOVA network working for, for your networking needs. So for example, like Rackspace Public Code uses, used, at least used NOVA network for the networking. So it is, it is not, from the operational point of view, it is not really a blocker. It is painful, but I, I wouldn't call out that Newton is messy, so OpenStack is not ready for adoption. There are a lot of features to that one. That we, we talked about a lot of varying features, uh, varying factors, but uh, I would like to separate those things, right? Mm. And, but having said that, the community has realized and worked well on that one, particularly like there, are, there are cool features that have gone into the Juno release, DVR, Distributed Virtual Writer, for instance. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a great feature that is going to uh, remove your single point of failure, making it much more scalable. So uh, that's kind of my take on that one, how the I personally like the way that the, the community has taken and uh, realize, realizing that, okay, it is messy, so we need to fix that up. You ask the developers, anybody would accept that how messy it is, but we have worked on it, and we're still working on it. Yeah, yeah basically, I think that Neutron is not bad because it is just an abstraction layer to manage networking operations. And I think when we have some bad experience related with maybe some drivers that Neutron is using, and I think it needs some time to evolve and, and uh, some, some basic evolution to go into the right direction. It, it was not designed correctly from the beginning, so it, was, it took more time to fix it. So yeah, yeah, of course, of course. But I think it is an advantage of this open collaboration that we can fix things. Maybe it requires some time, but, but uh, we have a very strong ecosystem inside OpenStack, and I'm sure it will be fixed because if we want to run OpenStack clouds in the future in a stable way, uh, we need to solve that problem. Yeah, I just so have to understand the question because this is enterprise, and enterprise is slightly different. You can fix things at scale when it comes to neutrons and things like that. Mm. When you're dealing with enterprise networks, they kind of like want to offer solutions, mm. and, and, and that's kind of, how, how long do you think it's going to take that? That's my question. Kilo? Oh, oh, definitely. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to mention names, um, but th there, are, there are distributions which I think have um, this well in hand, um, already announced and, um, and sort of pending announcement. So I, I, I think the networking, I mean, networking always is a challenge, um, but I think that the distributions are, um, you know, are addressing that. Okay. And I, I must say, I, I think that the if anything, the um, the interest in NFV from the um, the telco end is is if anything helping to accelerate that because those guys um, are pretty sensitive about their networking mm -hmm. and are pushing requirements and are pushing the community in a direction that that flows back down to the enterprise, you know, in a very positive way. Interesting. So we've got one question over here on the side. Um, one of the complaints from enterprise is the cadence is too fast six months release cycle it was even mentioned on the first day keynote mm. so uh, that well, I'll ask another question what do you think is the appropriate uh, time frame for backporting features into previous releases um, to support enterprise adoption no no the so enterprise doesn't want to adopt it because it gets much later to paint and that's really hard well if the enterprise, if so, if the I can see your point, but if the enterprise adopts IceHouse, for example, and there's a two-year backporting requirement for releases, right, then uh, they can effectively get those new features and still maintain their older version. So I guess my question is, what do you think is the right time frame? Yeah, I, I think uh, we are seeing this entire release thing from a uh, wrong point because maybe we could focus on the future to make... Nugget of wisdom would you give to the audience to leave with? Uh, you we know, can I start with Sri Ram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's one <laughs> sentence. On nugget, nugget, uh, nugget of wisdom is the tip that got me. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I've watched this, the OpenStack community grow over, you know, this is my fourth or fifth summit. I mean, it's amazing about how much it's growing. It's, it's amazing the diversity of interest that's coming. 
And I think that um, this definitely is the, if you're gonna catch a, catch a train, this is definitely the train to catch for um, the cloud, both, both public and private. Yeah, I think OpenStack is still in his early days. And the next five years will be very exciting for each of us. <coughs> and I'm sure we will solve most of the problems that we have now. And, and anyway, it is a fantastic moment and I enjoy every minute of this. You make two points. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else from you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first thing is kind of, e since we're talking about expectations, right? So um, I think having the right set of expectations is the way to succeed. Um, as a community and as a product and for the users and the developers, everybody is having better idea about what the right expectations are. So um, go with that. And if you need any help, like I think you, you are getting help in the community. So uh, it's always very helpful and you get enough, <coughs> enough help feedback, right? Um, second thing is like, I wanna uh, mention that uh, we are in, a, in an infle inflection point, I would say in the community. We've been there for four years and uh, it used to be a lot of startups now and now is the time that uh, big vendors are putting in, which is good for enterprise customers because like they need a lot of support, which is the big big players like HP, Red Hat, IBM, they're gonna provide, right? Naturally, they come with their own distributions and uh, they understand the enterprise uh, pain points better. So uh, especially on OpenStack, for instance, right? Like you have enterprise hardening uh, or you have scale up fixes, all those things, right? So um, what I'm trying to say is that, that those vendors will give you the stability and maturity that the enterprise customers want. Uh, having said that, it is not the end of ecosystem. I'm seeing, I'm expecting the second wave of uh, startups. That's where more innovation is gonna keep happening, right? That you can expect a lot of, we kind of solved the infrastructure problem. We looked at how do we deploy it easier, right? How do we make the automation easier? So we, we're, we're kind <coughs> of in a uh, stage where like we have a good answer for that. But now next step is like, how do we make it much more secure? Can we make cool things about it? Can you try bolder things like making Docker containers for the citizens, right? Those things, these big vendors might be hesitant to try, but that's where the second wave of startups would come in. So it's an active ecosystem, it's gonna keep continuing like that. So I'm very positive about the ecosystem and then like together we're gonna learn and together we're gonna solve the problem. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience does as well. And uh, thank, thank you guys for uh, enduring the, uh, the panel discussion. I hope it was worthwhile. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.